So you're an experienced bank angler, or rather you're just a pun weekend warrior, or you're just someone that's just getting into bass fishing. You probably catch some fish, but you want to catch even more fish and even bigger fish. Don't even worry about that. Your boy got you. You came to the right spot. We're going to go over five common mistakes that a lot of bank anglers make all across the country, and we're going to show you how to fix them, and we're going to put more 10 pounders in the boat on the land. Let's get it. Let's get straight to it. So the first common mistake that a lot of bank anglers make that I see all the time, you're fishing too short of a rod. A lot of guys start out with the 6-6 six, six rods, maybe like a 6-8 or something like that. But the main rod, the main length that you should be focused on, you should be focused on fishing seven foot rods and taller. And the reason you want to do this is because one, you get more casting distance on your lures. Two, you get more leverage on your hook sets. And three, you get even more leverage when you're dragging that jig, dragging that worm, dragging any kind of bottom bait. You're in constant contact with that longer, that longer rod. I can't really explain it. You gotta try it for yourself. But that longer rod, that longer tip, it keeps you in direct contact with that bait as you're dragging or scooting something along the bottom. And when you're dragging that bait, a lot of times you're going to have slack in your line and that extra rod length. Once you go to, once you feel something bite, you really want to just yank back. You can recover a lot more line and you can really have a more solid hook set and you're not really missing out with that longer rod and the extra leverage. The only time I probably wouldn't go with a seven foot rod is if I'm fishing like a creek someone with a lot of trees, trails, and you just don't have a lot of wiggle room, you might hit something above you or behind you. And also when you're jerkbait fishing, you want that shorter handle because you're constantly popping that lure and you don't want to be slapping yourself all in the reels, all in the elbow. So a shorter handle and a shorter length for the rod helps with jerkbaits and tight spaces. But if you're in it, anything outside of those two, seven foot rods all day long, better hookup ratio, more casting distance, and just better leverage all around. <laughs> The second common mistake that I see a lot of bank anglers make, they just simply don't fish the right rod action for the lure that they're throwing. For example, if I'm throwing a frog, I'm not going to throw a frog on a medium or a spinning rod. It just doesn't make any sense. When you're throwing a frog, you want to throw a frog generally on a medium and heavy to a heavy, depending on how thick the structure is. If you throw this thing on a medium, more than likely, if you're coming across thick lily pads of heavy structure, that fish is going to take that frog, go back under. It's going to dive you in all of the structure it can find and tangle you up and snap and break your line real quick. So you really, and a lot of times too, these are like reaction baits. So a lot of times you're going for more of the quality bass, which are some of the bigger and stronger bass. So with that being said, you need that stronger backbone strength from that rod. Because if you're fishing around that structure, you got to be able to set that hook and get them out of there immediately. Don't let them go back down and take you up around all the destruction. The same concept kind of applies to jigs as well. Anything with a straight shank hook, and it's kind of like a jig, chatter bait, spinning bait. I'm going to throw a medium heavy. A lot of times they just go for more quality fish, or I'm probably even fishing around grass. And with jigs, that extra backbone strength from a medium heavy, I could really rip that thing out of grass, and it'll really cause the skirts to flare up and unless it go to kick it. And sometimes it trigger a reaction strike from the bass. When you're fishing a medium, you're around structure and grass, you can't pop it. You can pop as hard as you want, but it may just pull some grass with your lure. You really need that stiffer rod so you can be able to snap it out of there, if that makes sense. You're not really pulling the grass. You just want to snap your lure out of there and give a bass like a split second to make a decision on that or let it get away. If I'm throwing a shaky head, I'm going to throw that on the medium spinning rod. I'm not throwing that on the medium heavy. Too much backbone for lighter lures. You're just going to overwork the bait. You're going to drag it out of the strike zone. It's not going to, you're just, you're just not going to work it effectively or properly. Medium, with some of your lighter lures, worms, flutes, you know, drop shot, all that finesse stuff, anything in jigs, frog, spinner bait, chowder bait, definitely get the extra backbone strength for the medium heavy or maybe even a heavy, depending on how heavy the structure is for some of these top water baits. And I will also even fish a medium with a crankbait because I really want that soft tilt so the bass can absorb those trebles in their mouth. Also, when you match the lure weight up with your rod, the rod tells you the specifications of what lures to throw in that range. And once you match it up the appropriate way, you're going to get the maximum casting distance. So be sure to pay attention and keep a lookout for that. The next common mistake that I see a lot of bank anglers make is not using the proper gear ratio for the particular lure that they are throwing. A great rule of thumb is to fish slower gear ratio for moving baits, and you want to use faster gear ratios for more of those slower baits, like dragging baits, something you got to drag along the bottom, or 
maybe a jerk bait you're going to keep popping and creating a lot of slack anything you need to recover a lot of line and slack that's when you use faster gear ratios but if you have uh, any kind of moving bait crank bait swim bait spinner bait swim jig anything that's swimming usually want a slower gear ratio and we want a slower gear ratio because it simply keeps our lure in the strike zone longer it gives it the maximum action and it allows it to dive down to the deepest potential of that bait we only want to use faster gear ratios when we're recovering a lot of slack recovering a lot of line and we really got to catch up with that fish on the hook set so anything any texas rig any kind of dragon jig that you're dragging on the bottom or casting finesse jig or whatever jerk bait and just anything that you need to recover the line with in general just remember that rule of thumb slower gear ratios for moving baits faster gear ratios for baits you're going to drag or pop or jerk or whatever just remember that keep that simple rule of thumb and i think you guys will be good so let's talk about the next mistake this is the one right here so you ever wonder why you can catch fish but you probably see other guys fishing some of the same ponds and lakes as you but they catch even bigger fish and probably more consistently. This brings me to the fourth mistake, and that is us bank anglers throwing only baits that we are comfortable with. Ooh, that's going to that's, that's going to make a lot of people feel some type of way. I already know there's a Billy Bob. I know there's a Jim Horton. So where, yeah, man, I throw a worm. I've been throwing a worm for 10, 15 years. They always caught me fish, dude. I've caught many thousands of fish on worms. I caught big fish, I caught smaller fish. But I didn't start catching bigger fish more consistently. That's the key, consistently, until I started throwing different baits. Everyone in my area throw the same baits. Everyone throw weightless worms. Everyone throw speed worms. Everyone just throw worms all day long. And nothing wrong with that. You're going to catch fish, but fish appetite changes throughout the year. And believe it or not, sometimes we think the bass aren't there, or they just not willing to bite. And sometimes we're casting out that we just think it's just empty. Man, those big bass be sitting right there looking at your lure. and watching it swim by, but they're not dumb. They already know it's fake. They're not going to eat that mess. A lot of those lures look fake. None of them look 100% real. So let me tell you what you got to do. It's our job as a bank angler. We have to force those fish to bite. We have to force feed them. So B or V, how do you make a fish bite if we can't see what's going on? You throw reaction baits. That is the biggest thing I always talked about on this channel. You've seen many videos in the past, or if you follow me on IG or Facebook, before I really got on YouTube, you've seen me catch a five, six, seven. I even called a 9.6 pounder like two, three years ago. And that's because I've been changing my bait selection up. What are some examples of reaction bait? Let's see here. Um, jigs. Jigs is like a big fish, quality fish capture all year long. Spirit of baits chowder baits, big swim baits like the big multi joint or even just a big salt by the swim bait. There are plenty different type of reaction baits out there. And in order to get a fish to react, we got to stop that constant, just slow, steady retrieve. Yeah, it works, trust me. I know I caught plenty of fish on it in the past. But if you want to get out of that mindset and start to catch bigger fish more consistently, I'm telling you, you gotta try. Instead of just doing that slow, steady retrieve, Sometimes maybe you burn it real fast, pause. Like sometimes I throw a chatter bit, I burn it three, four turn on pause. Or either I snap my rod and a lot of times on that pause, on that snap, that's where you just get hammered. And like you get some of your most violent reaction bites that way. Or if I'm fishing a jig and some grass, I'm dragging along the bottom, dragging along. I might feel myself come across some structure, across some thick clumps of grass. And instead of me just continuously dragging, I'm going to snap that. I'm going to give it like two good snaps. Trying to really jump it up out that grass, make it look like it's fleeing or something wrong with it. Now, a lot of times the bass be sitting right in that grass. They probably have watched your lure swim about a hundred times. But sometimes bass are just accustomed to seeing so many lures over time. They just really get in the head. They know what to eat. They know what not to eat. But when you start to do things that look a little different than other anglers, you snapping jigs out of grass. You just burning and pausing, making baits look like it's weak or wounded. You giving that bass a split second decision to eat. Or they just let it go by. And sometimes it's a chance that a bass just, they just can't, they, they can't resist. Bass are opportunists. So they will feed on just about anything if it's like, if it's free game and it look like a free meal. And they would knock that thing out the park. I'm telling you. The last common mistake that a lot of bank anglers are making is just simply believing that all of the bass are in the middle. And that's not always true. And this kind of brings you back to the last tip I just told you guys about, about the reaction bites. Bass are sitting there, but you just would never know because you're not making them react. You're not giving them that split-second decision. You just let them look at your lure for 
a thousand times is driving across their face slowly. Stop believing that bass are always just sitting out there in the middle. Control what you can control. That's the best advice that I can give you. Bass prefer the shallow water than the deeper water. That is like their natural habitat and natural homes. They're only going to push out deep if their conditions call for it. So remember to control what you can control. Fish shallow. Don't be scared. Don't get discouraged when you don't catch anything. Some days there are, there are bass that are still able to be caught. My best advice and my tips would be to look for structure, look for wind, look for depth change, composition change. And one great way to do some of these things, some things you can see with the naked eye, but there are some things like finding composition and depth change. One great bait for that is a Texas rig. Just drag that thing around from time to time, throw it out there, count down how many seconds it takes to fall. That tell you how deep the area is right there with the seconds that you count. As you're dragging it, just feel for the bottom. Does it feel mushy? Does it feel hard? Feel like maybe some gravel or rock, some grass? You can kind of put a mental picture or mental note in your head, and then you want to really focus on some of those key areas. Any area where the depth probably goes from shallow to deep or deep to shallow, um, any area with structure and grass, any area with composition change, those would be some of your key areas. So just keep targeting them. Maybe hit them with some different baits, slow baits, reaction baits. Just hit them with everything you got. But never believe that they're just always out there constantly sitting in the middle just doing nothing. Trust me. <laughs> So I know we talked about a lot. It's a lot of information. I was trying to go fast, try not to bore you guys. So I really try to give it to you, try not to hold your time too much. If you really want to see me go more in depth in any of these tilts, or you want to see a specific type of video in any of these that I just mentioned, drop in the comments. Let me know how you like the video. Let me know what you want to see. I promise you, I got you. I have another list, a part three for this video coming, but let me know what you want to see and I'll cook something up for that as well. So until next time, y'all keep those lines tight. Stay safe. Go and catch that 10 pounder. Peace.